segment of uh, Big Bang Theorel's BTS vlog. When you got something else in your mind, sometimes it's uh, difficult to sort of uh, remember what you're supposed to be doing, particularly here. Uh, anyways, uh, it is just about 20, it's just 23 hours and 15 minutes, or just about 23 hours and 15 minutes into the day of uh, Friday, September 2nd, 2016. Yeah, it's been a good day today. We did, uh, went out and did our peripatetics. We had a good discussion here. We're talking about the uh, psychology of the socialist mind, particularly with the... Con and we're going to get into, eventually, the whole concept of something known as a minion society. It, it's the society that, that produces the uh, totalitarian dictatorships, uh, like we saw with Stalin, Hitler, uh, Pol Pot, that's of Cambodia. Uh, basically, there is a mindset that is developed, a psychology of the society that produces the ability for someone uh, like that to come in and take full control because a large chunk of the control has already been ceded uh, uh, by the people to the government. In other words, as the government gains more and more control, someone comes in and takes over control of the government and this is how you ended up with a uh, dictatorship at the top of a minion society. So, uh, I think this is something interesting we can start to talk about uh, and get more into, but uh, uh, that's for a later time. Right now, I'm outside, I'm doing observational physics, uh, the observational uh, atmospheric physics, so that's the thing that's going on now. Of course, there's a train going by in the background. It's always one, you know, when they have a train going on in the background. I don't mind it. <laughs> I actually like trains, so. Um, and this is, this is the kind of cool thing is that, uh, speaking of the train whistle, divergent thoughts and ideas. Uh, it's about uh, 59 degrees outside. There's a good, uh, a good uh, breeze, so it actually makes the uh, the wind effect. Wind effect makes things uh, a little colder feeling, how it feels outside. It feels actually colder than it is. So the wind chill effect. And of course, uh, as the temperature drops off, what ends up happening is that uh, the, the things in the environment, like, like the sound, heat actually causes sound to be more muffled, so because there's a more the, the the air becomes denser, particularly with, uh, with the high humidity. But with low humidity and low temperature, uh, sounds are actually amplified because they become crisper. Uh, this is true for light. A lot of these 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 energy things uh, pass through a colder system faster and better than they do through a warmer system, which uh, scatters everything around. So. Uh, not, there's not too much scatter because you, you, do, so you still do get the sounds. That just what happens when you, you're sitting on here listening to them, you realize that there's a difference in the sound between whether it's whether it's warm or whether it's cold or you know hot or cold. There's a difference in the sound. There's also a difference in the color of the light. People, go, oh wow, how you know, you know they look they look at the uh, a stop sign right, and they see how red the red is during the winter or during colder days. Right? It's, it's getting chilly out, and look at oh, that's a very bright red. I never noticed that. Well, what? Uh, that's how light tr comes to us through the atmosphere, uh, and the temperature of the atmosphere, the temperature of the air between us, uh, between the object that you're looking at or hearing, uh, the temperature matters. Uh, the hotter the temperature, the more scattered the uh, the 
the lighter it's going to be, the more scattered the sound is going to be, and you're not going to have as crisp a sound or as crisp of a, a view of the light. So this is some of the physics that goes on behind. And this is this is out here looking at the, this. This is about hands-on physics as well. It's about seeing the physics that you're studying in the environment as it goes on. This is, this is sort of the whole uh, reason why you're out here doing this is because of this. So. Anyways, uh, I will talk to you in the next segment. Uh, we'll get more, more details into things. And, uh, yeah. Alrighty, everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the next segment of uh, Big Bang Theory, Alice BTS Vlog. It is currently 18.30. Yeah, 18 hours and 36. 18 hours and 30 minutes into the day of Friday. September 9th, 2016, yeah. We're out for another pair of potatoes. We go out uh, going food shopping. Uh, an unfortunate thing has happened. Yeah, not necessarily too bad, but it's you know, for, if you're like watching the vlogs, it's a bad thing, but uh, I lost a, one of the SD chips for this camera. And the bizarre thing, as I was, uh, taking the chip out of the camera, the slot that it goes in is uh, spring-loaded, so when I was taking it out, it kind of popped out, flew out of the, out of the uh, compartment, and I have no idea where it landed. <laughs> no idea whatsoever. So, that chip's gone with about a week's worth of uh, vlogs. So, <laughs> there's going to be some days missing. Uh, where they are, God only knows. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we're off uh, for another uh, adventure, or, or for a pair of protetics, actually. Uh, the walking meditation. I mean, the walking meditation, the pair of protetics, is a really old form of meditation. Yeah. It was rumored to be a school uh, of Aristotle's, a philosophy school, uh, where they walked and talked about philosophy. So we can take that aspect and understand that meditation is simply to think or to ponder something. And pondering is, in many ways, well, I would argue that it is philosophy. Philosophy is a ponderance. Sometimes it is specific and has direct answers. Other times the answers elude us. Uh, my view of ponderance and philosophy from experience is that it's like everything else, particularly in, in it can be compared in the quantum physics terms with the random walk and more particularly with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yes. And that's what makes things a lot of times random. That you can't know everything. And that knowledge is not known absolutely but approached. In other words, knowledge, all knowledge from person to person exists within the limit of absolute knowledge. So those of you who know calculus and understand limits, you now begin to understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so <laughs> this would be the peripatetics is getting into uh, some of the philosophy of mathematics. And people don't understand this. Is that mathematics was, in many ways still is, a philosophy. Is a, these are thoughts and ideas. And it's how you express these thoughts and ideas in a mathematical form. This is what the philosophy of mathematics is. It's not, you know, it's not just simply engineering. Engineering is a subset of philosophy. Because engineering takes the thoughts and ideas, the concepts, and transforms them into reality. In other words, you can look at it many ways, if you want to take a go back into history, and look at engineers in many ways like the alchemists, who were trying to take ideas and transmogrify them, change them into reality, or transmute them, 
right, from one property to the next, lead to gold. That's transmutation. Right? We know mutate, right, to change. Trans is to change from one form to the next, you know, it, to go between. Uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of where the mathematics end up, and this was not certain, certainly not lost on uh, philosophers like uh, Pythagoras. And, of course, think of this, and here comes another tangent. When we talk about the names, the Greek names like Pythagoras, Aristotle, so on and so forth, the Mosthenes, that's not exactly what you hear in Greek. And the arrogance of a lot of the philosophers, particularly Western philosophers, assumed, like in Shakespeare, and this is the analogy to what I'm talking about. Look at all the Shakespearean plays. Shakespearean plays. The one is one of the most one that I talk about is Romeo and Juliet. It's set in the city of Verona. Verona is in Italy. It's it's it's, it's an Italian city. It's not English. Yet yeah, everybody in the play has an English accent, <laughs> right? What is an Italian <laughs> doing with an English accent? Right? Have you ever heard an Italian with an English accent? I haven't. But this is this is a lot of times of the view of things, is that we don't consider the way things are from others' perspective. We consider things the way they are from our own perspective. In other words, the Greeks to the English spoke Greek the way the English speak Greek. And, well, it's kind of like a Bostonian accent and <laughs> and there's a lot of R's missing and this <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot to be desired for uh, 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 for what's actually there. So like I, I know somebody who's named Demosthenes but I never know him as Demosthenes didn't realize it for a while because the names didn't click I know him as Demosthenes He's one of my uncles, my, one of my theos. And the thing is, as much as I knew, I knew him as Demosthenes, Theo Demosthenes, it didn't click for a long time that that was Demosthenes, the, the, uh, the philosopher. So, this is what well, you have to realize is that in many cases, when you hear names, you, you're using the name Pythagoras, Pythagoras wouldn't have been called, that wouldn't have been the Pythagoras that we knew in Greek, that wouldn't be pronounced like that. It'd be pronounced differently. Anyways, it's time to cross, so I'll try to come back uh, in a little bit after we cross, so. Well, we've crossed the street. And we, look, look at that, a bunny. <laughs> Let's see if we can find that bunny. Uh, missed the bunnies long gone. Yeah, we have bunnies, squirrels. We have a fair number of amount of wildlife living here. So that's a cool thing. Not even walking off, I don't see them. Sometimes you walk off a little bit and you can see them again, but uh, that's not the case. Ironically enough, that's where I met the skunk last time. <laughs> Same spot. Uh, different animal. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've got wild rabbits around here. This is an interesting pit here. Here's a squirrel there. Trying to hide from me in the grass. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying about talking about names and, uh, the understanding of things. Uh, it's bizarre. People who initially grew up in a culture, even even the first generation, particularly with Americans, uh, the first generation in, in in the United States, in America, particularly because the United States has this concept called the melting pot, where you're supposed to leave your country and become American. And the thing is, is the ironically enough, although the melting pot is considered to be American, it's actually not really. American in terms of the philosophy of America. 
philosophy in America was individualism. That the individual could be whatever they wanted to be. So if you came and you were Greek and came to America, you should have been able to be Greek. Uh, but that wasn't the case. You had to be whatever the Americans wanted you to be at the time. That's how my last name, which was initially Karathanasis, when my grandfather came over, uh, it was changed to uh, Karis. Right? The Karathanasis, the, the history behind the name, uh, it was essentially lost unless, you, of course, you talk to your parents. And I couldn't talk to my grandfather because uh, on both sides, uh, my grandparent, my grandfather died when my parents were just really young. So uh, I never really got to know my grandfathers. So that that was out of the question. And talking to my grandmother, my Greek grandmother, my my yaya, and this is another interesting issue here. You ever heard about the. Uh, the uh, theory of the earth called Gaia. Well, every Greek knows it's not Gaia, it's Yaya. But of course the English are pronouncing the gamma with a G. So instead of saying Yaya like every other Greek does, they say Gaia. Well, no. It's actually Yaya. I said, so, but anyways, trying to talk about Yaya was kind of not necessarily possible because I didn't learn Greek properly. I still don't know my Greek properly. Uh, fooling around as a kid. Uh, didn't do much study, studying. I did what I wanted to do. I liked reading, but I didn't do much studying, so uh, my Greek never really developed. And that meant I couldn't necessarily understand my grandmother. So asking about my last name didn't occur to much later on till we're sitting down just looking at the correspondence my dad was getting, saw the name Karathanasis. He got an email from Greece. Or not an email, but a mail from Greece. And... Is that our name? I said, yeah, that's, that's the name was uh, before uh, the Americans changed it for, the grand, for, my, for my grandfather. So, I found out my name. Kathanasis. That's the real name. And I looked at my uncles, uh, the American ones, uh, and they had become very, my dad's brothers and sister, and they become very American. Even to this day, they're very American. Although they talk about being Greek, and they go to the Greek festival, they have a Greek festival every year. Their lives are typically American. They're not actually Greek in their day-to-day -day living. That was different up here. When I, when I came up here, I came up here as a baby. So I grew up in an immigrant environment uh, with immigrant families. And then in the church, what happens is that the way the church works is that people in the church uh, become your family. And so if you come close to them just the way you have a blood family, you'd have a spiritual family in the church just the same way. Just the same way. So the aunts were Thea's and the uncles with Theos. And so I had a lot of them. And once again, like my Yaya, because they were Greek, they were from Greece. But in Canada, unlike the United States, there was no pressure to, to Canadianize. In other words, in Ontario, under the conservative government uh, that was here at the time, there was no pressure. Oh yeah, it was Bill Davis, Premier Bill Davis. This came to the top of my premier, Bill Davis. He was a progressive conservative. He was English. But there was no pressure at any point in time to become Canadian. The Greeks, and whatever you were, were free, were free to be Greek. They were free to be, again, whatever they were, whatever they wanted to be. It was, it was, even though we were in Canada, didn't have the so-called American ideals. The ideals of individualism, which was basically English, was still there. So the concept of individual, individualism, which is an English uh, concept, not a uh, continental or European concept. Europeans have the concept of socialism. Individualism is particularly British or particularly English. 
So we had that because we were uh, a colony of the British Empire. Up until 1985, Canada was officially a colony. It wasn't fully independent. So up here we were free to develop the way we wanted to develop. You know, be what we wanted to be. Because English individualism was the fundamental rule. So that was the case. Uh, my uncles felt no need to really learn English that well. They picked up things here and there. They went through a few classes. But that was about it. So the accent and the primary language they use on a daily basis were primarily Greek. Because the immigrants kind of stuck together. And because they were family, each immigrant helped each other out. So if you were an immigrant who came in because you had a lot of family, you were never by yourself, you were never without uh, resources, because you always had your family to help you out. Uh, this is the way the church formed too. The church was formed as a family. It was outside the mainstream uh, churches. It was outside of the so-called authorized churches. And it didn't really dawn on me until I was uh, having dinner with my parents. This was when I was younger. And we had a lot of the uh, visiting priests and bishops stay at our house because my dad was the head priest at the church. And there was one bishop there, a Russian bishop, named Vitaly. And he was describing, in one of his uh, visits, when we were having our meals, we always talked around the meal, he was describing how they used to have divine liturgy in the concentration camps in, in Nazi Germany. And that there were a lot of Slavs, a lot of Russians, now called Ukrainians, in the concentration camps. So it wasn't just the Jews, there were a lot of Russians and uh, Serbians, the Slavs, there were uh, all types of uh, Slavs within the concentration camps. And they were describing how they would have divine, divine liturgy. And this begins to make me sort of realize that there was something more in my backyard, in my attic, than just old stuff to sort of be tossed aside and not really looked at again. So that always stayed in the back of my mind as I come up through physics, as I came up through astronomy. I guess that things began to shape up for me. I began to see things that, uh, uh, well, maybe there's, there's different, there's more to, to the world than what I've initially seen. So I had these little hints here and there. So I said, let's do more. And I realized what's in all my own backyard. And this kind of let me realize that, you know what? It's better being living on the Asian village style thing, the Pan-Asian, because I realized that the Greeks were actually Asians, they weren't Europeans. And a lot of the Greeks have been whitewashed, convinced that they were European instead of Asian. And the influence is to such a degree that my mom, who is darker skinned, always feels the need to, with lemon and other natural things, to bleach her skin so that she's white, she's Caucasian. And this is the pressure she felt from when she was a kid, going to school, that she should be white and not anything ethnic. But my experience growing up has been completely different. I said I grew up in an immigrant neighborhood with people basically not speaking English. Then when I moved out of the house, I moved into this neighborhood, the Asian neighborhood. So I've been around immigrants for my entire life in one form or another. And I can say that it is not the immigrants who are the problems in society in terms of the burdens on society. It's the native people, it's the white people. It's the people who are in North America. And this can be seen all over, even in England, where they've always had a really good healthcare system, they always had socialism. And if, as uh, some of my uncles like to point out, that this was about good governance, these people aren't, aren't stupid, they're uh, professors. They were vice presidents, they were tops of their industry. 
stating this. Good governance. If good governance was the issue, and I'm not using England as an example, because governance was already present in England, a lot more socialist than it is here in Canada, and certainly a lot more socialist than it was in the United States. So, the question of good governance. If good governance was a case, then all cases should be equal. So, let's take an immigrant family from India, because India was part of the Commonwealth of uh, England, so they had rights to move to England under the Commonwealth rules. So, the immigrant moves to England, moves into the low-rent neighborhoods, the subsidized neighborhoods, and within not even a generation, the kids and their parents and everybody are out, and they're fairly wealthy because they're driving around in BMWs. Here we go again, crossing. Okay. I'm letting this guy go. So this guy go here. Is it just watching a little bit, and you're alright. You just have to sort of be careful that make sure the driver see you and then you acknowledge this is another car here on the right who's gonna actually take on the right. That they see you and that you know they know you're there. So anyways. Where were we? Yeah. So the Indian family is there with less than a generation. The kids all move out. They have good jobs. They usually, if they encounter racism and are not a lot employed, they set up their own business, and their businesses are usually successful. Take the same place, the same housing complex. Put a white person in there, an English person. They're there for generations. The kids don't get off, the parents don't get off. They're more than likely, the kids that are in the neighborhood, like that, they will stay in that neighborhood and their grandchildren will be there. In other words, while social welfare is a hand up for the immigrant, it is a death sentence, a trap for the white person, for the native. So if we're talking about good governance here, this not, shouldn't be the case. And the thing is, this case is true all over. Wherever you see social welfare, particularly in, in, in Europe and in America, is the same thing. Who's trapped on the welfare system? The native people. Right? Americans, Canadians, so on and so forth. Who's not trapped on the welfare system? Immigrants. So when you talk about the immigrant question in the, in the 2016 election, the problem isn't the immigrants and the burden of the immigrants. The problem of the white people is the Americans themselves. Yeah, you never hear this in the election speech, during any of the election speeches. And ironically enough, you know, these same people who believe in good governance because they're professors and stuff like that, support Hillary Clinton. Say that we need a social welfare state. The United States is never good enough. Well, Steve Jobs was Syrian. My mom's Syrian. He came to Canada with his grandfather, came to the United States of Canada, built Apple. Where in the world do you see this? Where in the world do you see this possibility? And then it's nowhere. Look at Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, George Soros, right? Warner Brothers, the entertainment industry. These are all started by individuals. Rockefellers, one guy who set up, set up Esso and Exxon. One guy. He didn't start off rich. He didn't get his money from his parents. He built it all himself. And you don't see this anywhere else except for the United States. And this is what individualism is about. Individualism is about allowing the individual to pursue his life, to pursue his dreams, and to make himself whatever he wants to make himself, rich, poor, or indifferent. You know? But this is lost on a lot of socialists. And now a lot of these socialists are American. And they're doomed to the same fate that uh, most socialists are, do are doomed to. A life of disappointment. Because none of their fantasies will ever come true because they don't understand 
that it's not the government that makes you who you are. It's you who makes you who you are. In other words, it's individualism. It's Americanism. And this is the ideal that the United States should be going for. But this is the thing that eludes the United States because there are so many different beliefs and understandings of the United States that they conflict. And this is the battle. Shift people towards the American ideal of individualism, the true Americanism, and not the socialism that we're currently seeing. Another stop sign area here. Got to be careful going across. Uh, 6.37, still a lot of traffic, particularly on a Friday. Uh, as everyone's going shopping tonight. So it's going to be busy inside. Anyways, I'm going to leave this here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One vlog, 17 minutes, so we'll leave this here. Maybe do a little bit more when it come out. And that will be this vlog for today. So, alright. See you then. Democratic Earth.